are about to go on to the next um, special guest. And this special guest will be shown on the screen in a couple of moments. Um, his name, he's, he's a legend, he's a legend. And he's a great person. His name is uh, Dean Jackson. Um, Dean is what some people call a marketing Buddha. He's a, he's a guy who really gets marketing and he actually really loves marketing. He has a really popular podcast with, uh, with Joe Polish, uh, our mutual friend. And um, he's just a guy with so much wisdom, uh, so much knowledge, but also somebody who really understands uh, how to really create a life worth living and how to really have your business run for you so you can actually do all the stuff that you really like to do if it's in business or outside of business. So um, I would really love you guys to give a warm welcome for Dean Jackson. <laughs> oh. That's great. Awesome, man. So good morning to you. Well, thank you. I feel like I'm almost there. Yeah, you are. You are. I mean... Uh, Thank you so much for being here, man. I really appreciate it. Um, as I said, we're with a really powerful group right now of 300, almost 300 people. And we've been, um, been educated the last two days by a lot of internet marketing masters. Oh, on that's how awesome. To, yeah, it's really good on how to grow their business and, and also how to adapt their lifestyle um, to their business instead of, uh, I have to, how to adapt their business to their lifestyle instead of the lifestyle to their business. And mm -hmm. You are such an amazing person to be here today because we have so much to learn from you, and I'm so, so grateful that you're here. So, oh, okay. again, a warm welcome for Dean Jackson. <laughs> so this is, um, this is called the Internet Marketing Summit, and I know you're a big lover of marketing. What, what I really am. Yeah, so what did marketing or what has marketing done for you in your life? Well, I'll tell you what, so, in the, you know, I started out in a, as a real estate agent in 1988, so 27 years ago now, and the whole thing that switched the whole game for me was learning marketing and applying that to my real estate business. I started out, and real estate is a business where you had to make a lot of cold calls on the telephone or do you know manual prospecting. And then when I discovered marketing, what I was able to do was get off of that hamster wheel of making all those phone calls and figured out how to get people to call me. And then once I did that, I was completely free because it was such a um, such leverage, you know, to be able to uh, do that. And then I was able to take the things that I was applying in my business and package them up and teach them to other real estate agents around, you know, in other markets that were not in my market. And we built a huge company all over North America doing that. Um, and then applying all these marketing uh, things that I've been learning to helping all kinds of different businesses. So marketing for me has just been, it's been my whole life. It's been everything that I have is because I, you know, started learning and studying and fell in love with marketing. So what's the difference between pre-marketing and after-marketing? So the moment that you figured out like direct response marketing, what's yes. the real difference in way of working before and after for you? So before, Everything was, I described it like a hamster wheel where, you know, do you have hamster wheels in Amsterdam, you know, where the hamsters get on and they yeah. spin the wheel. Yep. And as long as they're on there spinning as fast as they can, the wheel moves and continues to move. And that's what the prospecting was like. I'd have to get on the phone and call people until you found someone who wanted to do business. And then as soon as you stop doing it, it stops working. And then after marketing, once I discovered that you could put words on paper or put words in an ad or on a postcard and get people to call you, now it's something that's working while I wasn't working. And that was really the, that's what frees you up to then continually build on top of that, you know? 
but it's just been the the leverage and the freedom and you know when you figure out the words that work on a thousand postcards or a thousand uh, in an ad that's going to be seen by a thousand people you can then use that same words and multiply it to 10,000 or 100,000 people without any more effort yep. just the ability to turn money into more money yep. instead of turning time into money what i what i really love about you is that you're you're um really in love with marketing i was at your I really home, am. yeah <clears throat> i was at your home a couple of months ago and um you were showing me all these postcards and this new campaign and these <laughs> these i mean it like 40 words, but it took you like days to really craft the perfect <laughs> message and to split yeah, test it. And, and it's yeah. so amazing that after all those years, um, it's really something you do. It's something that you actually are. And, yeah. and, uh, and that's amazing. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, so I really love one of your phrases and the phrase is, I know I'm being successful when. That's the phrase, right? right? Yes. Can you elaborate on that? Sure, absolutely. So, you know, those, I did that um, about 15 years ago now with a friend, Thomas Leonard. And Thomas Leonard was a gentleman who started um, the life coaching sort of um, popularized that. He started a, um, in the United States here, Coach University and certifying coaches. And he was a really good friend of mine. And we were talking about this idea that most people look at success as something that is aspirational or in the future and out of reach, not something that they're experiencing right now. It's something that they're working towards. And so what we did was kind of turn that into the only time that you can experience something is in the present. So we turned the question into what would it, let's push the accelerator pedal look forward and say, how will I know when I'm being successful? And so if you're being successful, you can experience that success in the moment, in the day. That's the only time you can experience anything. Yep. So we made this, um, this list of how you would answer that question. So mine, I know I'm being successful when and then I have 10 different things that I say. So the first one is, I know I'm being successful when I can wake up every day and say, what would I like to do today? That's my number one thing for, I know I'm being successful. Then my second one is that I know I'm being successful when my passive revenue exceeds my lifestyle needs. Now, when, when you look at these, you know, these things are equally true 15 years ago as they are today and as they will be 15 years from now because they really get to the essence of what are my sort of core values. And everybody will have different answers to this. Everybody will have a different way to say, I know I'm being successful when. And so when I looked at it, I knew that, and I surrounded by, and we all are in business, you're surrounded by opportunities to, to make a lot of money, but then you're surrounded with opportunities to, to buy a lot of stuff, to uh, build a lifestyle that depends on uh, leverage, like getting loans or leasing things or, or all these things where now you have a lifestyle that requires you to continue to work to maintain it. And I made the decision early on to let my um, lifestyle lag behind my income. You know, so it's a really big like, focus on, I. it's more important to me to wake up every day and say, what would I like to do today than it is to have a bunch of stuff that requires me to say, well, I've got to get up and work so I can pay for all this stuff. So my, the passive, the way to opening up yourself to freedom is through having passive recurring revenue that's coming in, whether you do anything today or not. So that really was a big um, shift. And I've, I've focused everything that I do in my business on making that, um, making that a reality. I love it. And then, 
Yep. I have one more that will that's kind of ties those together is I know I'm being successful when I'm working on projects I'm excited about and doing my very best work. And those, you know, when you say that now, it's not the point of, of saying what would I like to do today is not just to live a life of leisure and to have passive revenue is not just to not do anything. It's I, I love what I do and I love that I'm working on projects. Like I said, we're not like the postcards and the, the direct response things that I was showing you when you were at my house are things that I just, I love doing those things. And it's different when you're coming from a position of getting to choose the projects you love versus doing projects that you have to do because you got to do it for the money. You know, it's a whole different, it's a whole different world. So you do actually work. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but, so. but I love it. You yeah, know? man, it's, it's, that's awesome. So that's really already really good. Awesome advice. Um, Talk about the story. When I was at your house, you were talking about that you went, I think you went to a Starbucks or something and you were reading the Success Magazine and you had a big insight. Do you remember what oh, I'm talking yeah. about? Well, it was so great because I've been lately thinking about this, you know, 25 years as a, uh, you know, looking forward. And that, you know, it starts with looking back. I remember when I was younger, it was harder to see kind of, and imagine 25 years forward, right? But I'm 49 now, so I'll be 50 in May. And so I've had now a 27 year business career already, but looking back, it dawned on me, just I was at um, Starbucks, I was looking at these magazines, I was having just a great day. And I was thinking about the things that bring me joy. And I was realizing that the day that I had was exactly like the type of day that I would have, I really enjoyed 25 years ago, like waking up, going to the bookstore, looking for some books, getting some magazines, going to the uh, coffee shop, looking through the magazines. But it dawned on me that, you know, the enjoyment of that 27 years later, or 25 years later, was, it, you know, it's a different experience in that I was looking through the magazine and So my friend, Tony Robbins, is on the cover of the magazine. I've got a full page um, ad in the magazine. There's a list of the 25 most influential people, and I have 11 of them on speed dial, and I realized how different the circumstances are, like just the amount I have way more money than I had then. I have way more um, opportunity, way more skill than I had then, but the simple joy in actually what the day was, was just, there's no change in that. And it was kind of a, uh, just a perspective building moment for me, you know? Love it, love it. So talk about your super happy fun day. Well, those, I, I love that concept. That's kind of, I like to take free uh, time and, and I have this uh, concept we call super happy fun days. And they're really like a full day where you do nothing but have fun. And you know, it's great to pick some friends. And I guarantee you, you know, the fun thing is when you do it with one or two or, you know, a small group of people that you, uh, that you don't normally get to spend that much uh, time with, but to block it off and to have a full day where you spend the whole day together doing only things that are super happy fun for you. So maybe it's uh, going to play golf and going to a movie and going for dinner and going to the bookstore and all those things all in one day make a, uh, that makes a memorable type of day. And it's different than just trying to like, uh, squeeze in a movie in the middle of a, a, a regular work day. Um, you know, it, it makes it so much more refreshing and something more to, uh, to look forward to. And that, so I try and make those a regular, uh, a regular thing. And it's fun to see other people when you, when they're, uh, experiencing them with you, you know, they're used to just kind of sneaking off to get some time off or to do some, Uh, things like that, but to have a full, you know, I, I think if you make a list 
for yourself of what would just be a super happy, fun day for you and block that off. It's hard to um, sometimes just like do that spontaneously. But if you, most people, if you look out two weeks from now, beyond two weeks, we don't really have firm plans for everything. But if you're looking at your current schedule, like the next three or four days, or even the next week, everybody knows exactly what they're doing. But if you go off in the calendar, maybe two Tuesdays from now, and you block that day off, or you block off uh, the Saturday or whatever with a super happy fun day, and you plan ahead for it, it's something to look forward to. And I guarantee you it's so much more revitalizing and rejuvenating than uh, just trying to, you know, squeeze in some time. What, what you really do well, and, and you became a master at it, um, is that you do that, I think, that's an assumption, but I think without any guilt. And a lot of entrepreneurs, right. they actually feel guilty when uh, they unplug for a full, I mean, a lot of entrepreneurs are feeling guilty if they unplug for five minutes. And, yeah. um, but for you, I think it's pretty, pretty okay to just unplug for a day and have a super happy fun day. Yeah, I think that too. And I think that part of the thing, it depends where, I think what gives you a still mind is knowing that your passive revenue exceeds your lifestyle needs. And the guilt might be that you're, uh, you in know, the, in the hamster wheel. Yeah, that you have to, that you're feeling like, well, I should be working because I need to generate, uh, I need to generate money. But, you know, if you focus on, um, on those type of things that are going to generate passive revenue or buy that, uh, that time, that's a great thing to, to start with. Cool. Who here in the audience is actually listening to the I Love Marketing podcast? So show of hands. So if you can go around the room with a, with a camera, if you keep your hand up. Oh, that's, that's great. That's, that's pretty cool. So a lot of people already know you. Cool. I love marketing. Yeah. <laughs> so again, who here who here is listening? And who from you guys want would actually like to ask Dean a question? <laughs> they know everything about you. So yeah, ah. that's it. Anybody? Anybody from the audience wants to ask Dean a question? Now is the opportunity. Okay, so there's a question coming up. Hi, my name is Lucas. I'm wondering who's the real boss in the podcast because it's always a nasty game between you two. <laughs> who's the real boss? So for That's the people, so the, for the people who don't know and don't listen to I Love Marketing, Dean is doing a, the podcast I Love Marketing with with uh, Joe Polish, and Joe Polish is uh, he's a character, and yeah. Um, and and yeah. So the question so is, yeah, go ahead. The, oh, part of the dynamic. That's you know I've known Joe for uh, twenty three years now we've been friends we really have a great relationship and part of the um part of the the thing about the podcast is that we kind of bicker like brothers sometimes would you know or the whole uh that whole dynamic and i think that that the way i describe that to people is that we have the perfect balance of respect and disrespect for each other and that's what makes it kind of uh interesting but we love each other we really do. It's uh, we have a great relationship. Cool, cool. Yeah, Joe is awesome. A mm -hmm. and other I love marketing listeners who would like to ask a question. Yeah. So in the middle, over here. And we spoke today. Um, we had Dennis, who is also an active I love marketing listener, and oh, he yeah. he did a presentation about the power of podcasting. That's something. I would like to ask you some questions about on uh, later, but uh, but here's a okay, question. Okay, yeah, perfect. Yeah, here's I love podcasting. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Patrick. I got a question. Uh, what's the main thing you learned from Elko? You know what? I'm, I'm going to show you something. Hang on one sec. Oh, where is? It? Yeah, yeah. Look at this. <laughs> I'm going to show you something. Elko, <laughs> this journal right here, and Ed Dale gave me this fountain pen, which now I have a pen worthy of this journal. And what Ilko, uh, what I was fascinated by, Ilko came, we spent, the first time um, we were together, he spent, we spent three days together in London. And uh, Ilko, if you know 
about him. He's got these amazing journals and he just keeps like wonderful notes. And I, I, I journal myself and Ilko, um, you know, gave me this idea of having a journal that is, um, I'm, this is a special journal for, uh, I'm really keeping track of like my 25 year um, vision and the bigger life stuff in this journal because it feels like wow you know when somebody buries this up some archaeologist buries this up 500 or a thousand years from now this is going to look like it's very important <laughs> that's why you have to walk around with a book like that to look very important so, exactly uh, yeah. it's fantastic so it helps revere the ideas it's true and it's it's we we actually we have at this summit we have one stand uh, is juliette in the room so Julieta, she actually has a business in selling those notebooks. Oh, so her, really? Her wow. primary business is, this, is... Is that where this one came from? Uh, yeah, it did. I oh, ordered it awesome. through well, mylovelynotebook.nl. And, yeah. um, and we have a stack of those books at the office, which we give to our customers. And, uh, but anybody... Because <clears throat> for me, it pains me to be here with like this. <laughs> because it's this, I'll throw this away. And all the, uh, the great insights we have, um, I think it's a shame if you capture it in just, a, just you know, something like this. And it's amazing if you really build on a legacy with those journals. And yeah. um, so it's a, it's a good thing. So I'm happy you learned one thing. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's awesome. And so any, any other I Love Marketing listeners who would like to ask a question over there? Anybody else? Okay. I was eyeballing you all the time, uh, Yessa. Um, hi, Dean. I'm yours. Hi. I'm you a big to, fan you can, of you yours. You can look that way. I'm, if you I'm a big fan of yours and uh, I Love Marketing podcast. I think I almost listen to every episode. Okay, oh, every, every episode of, uh, um, of your podcast. The, I know that you uh, are very knowledgeable about almost everything doing, uh, having to do with marketing, especially uh, direct response marketing. And that you invented more or less, no, invented the squeeze page or opt-in page. Can you uh, give us a little insight <coughs> about how you used direct responsive uh, marketing on squeeze page or opt-in page so we can understand yeah. it a little bit better? Sure, absolutely. You know, and that, the thing about the, the squeeze page, what he's talking about is a, an opt-in page where people can go and just leave their name and their email address as the only option. And I'll tell you now, more than ever, those, um, the less that you can put on that page, the better is for the higher uh, opt-in rates. And there's a really key distinction here that most people, I separate completely the two parts of this, which I call compelling and convincing. And the only thing that I'm focused on on that opt-in page, on the squeeze page, is compelling somebody to leave their name and their email address, not convincing them to do anything beyond that or convincing them to do something in the future, all I want to do, I just break this down and know that the first step, regardless of what we're going to ask them to do in the future, is that they have to leave their name and their email address. So I have found that the less that I put on those pages, the better. And so the best offers that, uh, that I have, like we have opt-in pages now that convert in the you know, 65, 70% opt-in percentage range that are, uh, that are book offers. That's been the very best thing um, that we've done is to um, offer a free book and offer nothing else on the page. So we run, uh, I'll run um, ads like the ad I was talking about in Success Magazine. I'll run a big a full page ad bring people to a, uh, a landing page that only offers the, the book. So we did a book called Email Mastery. 
and we just offer the book to people. And from from magazine traffic, we got and get a 68% opt-in rate. So that means that 68 out of 100 people that come to that page leave their name and their email address. And now that I'm able to engage in a dialogue with all of those people and I can really take my time to conversationally convince those people of everything that they need to know to, to take advantage of the offer that we're going to make to people. So when did you make your first dollar online? Wow, so my first dollar online would have been 1997. That's crazy. Yeah, back then, that was when I was experimenting with the, uh, that was when autoresponders were just coming into play and, and you could send out, you know, bro you could broadcast email to, uh, to your subscribers. And what I found, that was where really when, where the squeeze page came into plays like a lot of people you had the ability to people to subscribe on your website but what most people were doing was they were putting that just on their home page with all so there were every other thing that you could click on on your website and an offer to subscribe to their newsletter or whatever and what i found was that when i took away everything else and only focused on leave your name and your email address, response went up. And so that was where I made it this, yeah, I didn't name it a squeeze page. Jonathan Mizell named it a squeeze page um, to because it just, it's the only thing that happens on the page. They either come and they leave their name and their email or they don't. And that's okay because I knew that the five-star prospects, the people that we really want to do business with, they, they would leave their email address. Yeah, cool, awesome. Um, we're going on for a question in a, in a few uh, minutes, okay. but um, I would like to ask you about a technique which is extremely powerful, and I learned this when we were in London, and I saw, I mean, we were in a group, it's called the Breakthrough Blueprint, it's a three-day event that Dean is doing, and we're gonna do one in Amsterdam in July. Uh, awesome. And um, so it's a three-day way with 12 people. It's going to be amazing. Um, um, but I learned about the nine-word email. Right. And um, it's unbelievable. So we were, I was in London in a group. There were 12 people. And there was a guy sitting next to me. And he was selling motor pants, so motorcycle pants. And the guy was selling $500 pants through the, this concept called the nine-word email. So can you, can you talk a little bit about this thing, which is yeah, an, a, it, it's an amazing formula and it's yeah. something we can all apply today yeah well that's what I would say right now is anybody in this uh, room who's been in business for more than 90 days I can see you guys from the back like can people just raise their hand if you've been in business for more than 90 days okay so everybody in the room basically has been in business for more than 90 days and here's what you do if you have prospects people who have left their name and their email address or their contact information, or if you own a retail store, they've come into your store or they've inquired on your website, they've done anything, and you haven't really connected with them in 90 days or so, you can send a this very simple nine-word email. And the one that we did it with first was for real estate agents, people who are helping people buy homes. And so we send an email to them, to your prospect, just have their name in the subject line and the nine words, the simple, the whole content of all of the email is, um, Ilko, are you still looking for a house in Georgetown? That's it. That's the whole nine words. So what we do is what uh, Ilka was talking about with David, who is doing the motorcycle uh, jeans. You know, he sent an email and said, Ilko, are you still looking for stylish motorcycle jeans? We had another uh, guy who sent an email. He's a yacht broker. And he sent an email and said, are you still looking for a yacht? And he uncovered 
a hundred million dollar yacht buyer, somebody who had been in their files, who had not, he literally was in a, a broker, a yacht brokerage. And these guys are, uh, you know, mostly older guys in that kind of um, world, but they had a file in their office, literally called dead leads. <laughs> Means leads that they, de they had determined these leads weren't going anywhere. And he started just sending an email to these leads and said, are you still looking for a yacht? And uncovered somebody who was looking for a hundred million dollar yacht and is now under contract on a, on a custom built um, yacht. So if your whatever your business is, whatever it was that they inquired about, if you just send those nine words to somebody, you're going to be amazed what happens. And here's the thing is you've got to be careful that you don't add to it. That's going to be the temptation. You're going to be tempted to say. To make it professional. Because if you are, yeah. you know, that blah, 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 filling people in on the thing. You want this to be as close to a conversation as you can. It's like you imagine that you, you recognize somebody and you see them at Starbucks and you just go up and you ask them that question. Say, Ilk, are, you st are you still looking for a house in Georgetown? And then you're quiet. And in that, that sort of society tension, you know, where in the way that, and this is worldwide, when somebody asks you a question, when somebody comes right up to you and looks at you and asks you something, it's expected that you're going to respond to them. And that feels so compelling to those people that they have to respond, even if they're, um, even if they're not, they'll reply and say no, but they'll give you a reason why, yep, yep. you know, or they'll say, oh, yeah, I was just thinking about that. You know, we're we're getting ready now. It, it's amazing. It's an amazing conversation starter. And mm -hmm. it's um, so I went to to Dean in London and we spoke about this and I, I, I implement what I learned. So I send a mail. And at that time, the responses on my email, they, they weren't that great. Uh, we didn't get a lot of responses. And. Uh, so I implement exactly what I learned from Dean, which is really easy because it's just nine words. And the email I sent was just the name in the subject title, as I learned from Dean. Um, and then not like, hey, this or just no, no, no uh, first name. The only words I said, like, how are you and how's your business doing? Let me know. And, um, and we get over 2,000 responses. So 2,000 people who replied. And it was so funny. It was like a week before I left on a five-week trip with my family. And I committed to replying to all those 2,000 people. And they replied back, and it was back and forth. So I was like answering emails for a full week. But it was a really great conversation start, a really great way to reconnect with a list that was pretty old already. Yeah. Who here already implemented this in the past? OK. And did it work for you? Cool, cool. Jesse has a question over there. There's a mic coming up. I think Jesse uh, put me on I Love Marketing a couple of years ago. Oh, yeah, you were listening for like a year or something, and I was like, yeah. Hey, Dean, I'm Jesse. Hi, nice to meet you, you finally. I've been a big fan of your work for years. I think I've, oh. uh, I started listening to the I Love Marketing podcast actually from the first episode onward, and I remember Is all the right? old, uh, low um, audio quality, scratchy episodes. Do you remember them? I do. <laughs> they were great. Um, I just wanted to ask you, um, could you li give us a little bit behind the scenes on the podcast? What were some of the most successful episodes over, I think if we're doing this for like five years? That's an easy yeah. question. Co Comment-wise, uh. download-wise, yeah. and, um, and, and, and what do you attribute that success to? So we were just talking about that. I was just with um, Paul Colligan, who does all the behind-the-scenes stuff for the um the podcast and we we're looking at the the number the uh episodes and so the uh tony robbins episode is the number one most downloaded episode and that was actually one of my absolute favorite episodes because i had a shift in that one you know we there's a very famous quote by peter drucker where he says um, 
the only two things that matter in business are marketing and innovation and everything else is an expense. Well, I would always take um, comfort that I'm in marketing and I thought innovation was something for high tech companies or inventors or packaged uh, goods companies and stuff. And when Tony described it, I started thinking about that really, uh, because we asked the question of people, when did you fall in love with marketing? And Tony said, well, I never really did love marketing, but I loved getting results and I loved people. So I just focused on that. And I thought to myself, it just clicked in that moment that that's really what innovation is. Innovation is just about getting better at getting a result for people, right? So when you get better at getting that result, that is a, an innovation. And so that was a big shift for me. That shifted a lot in the way that, uh, the way that I think. Then um, the other episodes that were the um, highest ones were the one about cheese and whiskers is a uh, is one of the top um, downloaded episodes, and um, that whole concept has been a real um, game changer too of just understanding how people are a lot like mice and that they're afraid and they have some you know, basic uh, things. And when you think about it, the prime directive of a mouse is to get cheese and avoid cats. And that's really the way that our prospects are, the way that, that our, our clients are that same way. They wanna get the good stuff and they wanna avoid being losing or taking advantage of or being hurt in any way or losing money. And if we can just focus on that desire that people have to, to move forward um, and to be you know, compelling to them, that's really, that's why these opt-in pages get so much because there's all cheese and no whiskers on them, right? It just, it's all just giving people the, the things that they really want without any sense of um, that, that anything's going to, um, we're not future pacing, we're not, no commercial um, intent uh, sort of telegraphed in it. And that's been a big, um, that's been a big game changing um, um, episode. And then we did an episode where we talked about Joe's uh, magic rapport formula. And if you guys you know about Joe Polish, you know that he is as connected as anybody in the world is. I mean, the guy is, uh, you know, just a total um, a connector. He, he's, uh, you know, been able to introduce uh, me to, you know, so many different uh, people. He's Richard Branson's largest uh, fundraiser. And that was another, we had uh, Richard Branson by a video on, on Nectar Island. That was another um, popular episode as well. But I, I just, there's so many great ones. It's hard to narrow it down, but those would probably be my top, uh, my top three. And um, <clears throat> what I love about the way that you guys are actually doing the podcast, it, it's not directly to really make more money or mm. to get more promotion or, or following or whatever. What's the deeper purpose almost for recording the podcast? Yeah, I, you know, there's the thing is like we we talked about this a lot that the whole idea is to because we, we started out, we've been having these conversations for, uh, you know, for 20 years before we started the podcast. I mean, we, you know, we're <laughs> like I said, we're really good friends. We talk on the phone all the time. And then just one day we've decided you know, wouldn't it be great if we just started uh, recording these conversations? Because we had we had come up with a big breakthrough just on a on a phone conversation, and we said, you know, this would be great. If, this would be a great um, podcast. And our, you know, we both have our um, businesses that are that run and are successful um, businesses. We didn't start the podcast as a business to make money from 
the the podcast, although the podcast has certainly made both of us, um, it's in, helped our businesses by doing it, but that wasn't the whole purpose of it. It's not that every episode is designed to, uh, you know, to monetize every episode or that, you know, this one's brought to you by this such and such or, um, or whatever, or the whole purpose of it is to just set up for somebody to, to buy something else. We wanted it to be just everything that we know about marketing all recorded in, in one place. And of course, because we're both out and still uh, really growing our own businesses, we keep learning more and more and more about what, so we never run out of stuff to continue to, uh, to talk about and document. So, and you're really building a legacy this way. Well, that, you know, and I say that, that I said to Joe, we make these, um, yearbooks of the, we just finished up the next one. So ever we have the, um, all the episode, this is, 101 to 150 we just finished up the the um the 151 to 200 but i said to joe imagine and i have to be careful when i say it so i'm not saying this to compare ourselves to to claude hopkins and albert lasker and you know those the legends from like a hundred years ago but i said imagine if those guys a hundred years ago had gotten together every week to talk about all the coolest stuff they were doing and learning about marketing, what kind of an incredible treasure chest that would be to uncover a hundred years later. And so that's really the, the thing is when I think about that is like a hundred years from now when people are, are studying marketing. And by the way, I mean, the principles of marketing apply uh, you know, a thousand years ago and, and a thousand years from now, you know, if you've ever read any of the philosophers, you read Seneca and you read uh, all these things, these guys are, you know, in 4 BC talking about things that are just so equally, uh, equally applicable today because our, our brains haven't really evolved that much from then, you know, uh, that, that, what a collection that's going to be for a hundred years from now. Yeah, so that's amazing. kind of a fun thing too. That's amazing. Thank you. That's, that's awesome. Any other, I love marketing listeners who would like to ask a question. Yeah. Over there. Hey Dean, I'm a big fan of yours. I actually got uh, introduced uh, through the podcast you did with uh, Ilko in uh, April, was it? I guess that was a great one yeah, too. How uh, could I forget? That's one I know. Of my I was, I'm waiting and waiting and yeah, yeah. weeping and <laughs> 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 and uh, actually, it's uh, my name's Jeroen, uh, by the way, and uh, I'm starting a podcast of my own, uh, and I made the decision today. I already did a couple of interviews with uh, with inspiring fathers. Um, that's uh, this, that's my business. I'm in the father business, but um, yeah. I've <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> and I got a question for you. Um, um, what are your advice for me as a starting uh, podcast interviewer? What are your biggest um, insights you could give me right now and other people who are listening? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, congratulations. First off, that's a great thing. I think that the the best advice that I can give you is to keep at it. Uh, consistency is the the thing. I mean, we've been doing, we've done an episode every single week for 230 weeks now and never missed uh, an episode. So, you know, you get that level of consistency and you, you it's amazing how far reaching it can be. Um, one thing that's very helpful is to have a an overriding context for the podcast. So our uh, the podcast is all based around our what we call the breakthrough DNA process, which is the uh, eight profit activators. So we've got a, a whole approach to business that is a context for it. So whatever you know, if you could think about what your what your context is, that's kind of universally. Um, applicable to your audience, then all of the content that you create fits nicely 
in this bigger collection. So it's not just these random interviews with no sort of um, with no context around them. That would be my my uh, big advice. And then don't worry about um, you know, as I said, a lot of people think well monetizing the podcast. Um, it, 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 what it does is it's an incredible audience building tool. And then what you have is the ability to then invite people to do a live event with you or to uh, be part of a, a case study program with you or to be part of an online program with you, but all with the goal of serving that community. I mean, our purpose is to help entrepreneurs make more money. So everything that fits, everything underneath it is geared with that in mind. Is this going to help somebody make more money? Awesome. So two more questions, two final questions from I Love Marketing listeners. Philippe. Hi, Dean. Hi. Hey, my name is Philip. I was in, in Chicago last year at the uh, Strategic Marketing Summit. I was okay. there with my 18-year-old daughter. She took a picture with you. She asked to get on a picture with you. If I oh, tell right. her, I will tell her I talk to you, she'll be uh, amazed. Oh. Um, Dean, what would be your advice? So what do I do? I help people to get um, happy and proud by investing. In, in whiskey, in casks of Scottish old uh, old whiskey. Yeah. Now this is a luxury product. We are talking yeah. about twenty five thousand dollars and up. Uh, uh -huh. And this concept is is not known. Not no, no people know about this concept. This possibility of investing in a, a real asset, a tangible asset, which is Scotch right. whiskey. How would you uh -huh. start uh, promoting this 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 investment? What would be your so it's a great advice. question. So here we go. So the first thing, this is, and people um, invest in whiskey. That's so it's not that they're doing it to consume sort of thing. Like people buy uh, cases of wine as an investment to sell in the future. Like they buy a cask. They buy a cask yeah. of, let's say, 15 years old, and they keep the yeah. cask in Scotland, uh, maturing for five or ten extra years. To yeah. sell the cask again for much more money, yeah. of course, or the proceeds, okay. we, which are the bottles. So it's not about yeah. drinking, it's about investing. Ah, perfect. As an alternative so, to banking, tr traditional banking, financial products. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So that kind of thing, are there, uh, I think that the closest thing to the, the bullseye would be people who have heard about this as an investment, that they, they're familiar sort of with it and they're seeking it out, they are what I call invisible prospects, right? You can't buy a list of people who are considering investing in whiskey, but we do want to be able to find them. So what you would, what I would look at doing is, is there market data about the prices of the current prices of whiskey that are now being sold kind of thing. So you can kind of build that, um, build that case for people. Like I would look at if there are a way that I could put together the, and I don't know how, how quickly the prices fluctuate on that, whether they fluctuate annually or quarterly or uh, more sporadically that I would look at putting together, for instance, the, um, the 2016 guide to or report on 25 year old uh, whiskey prices or how, you know, I'm stumbling over the words, but you get what I'm talking about because I don't, this is the first I've ever heard of it. But if you put it, put together the almost like the, the market data that somebody would be able to use if they were evaluating the decision process of whether to invest in it. So often we'll do things like, um, we have a, a gentleman in Canada who puts together a list of US hockey scholarship 
programs, a directory. And so the, the, the idea is that we're getting using the market data to compel your invisible prospect to ask for this so that you know that there's somebody who's interested in it. And now you can build the case for investing in it rather than that was where I was trying to, to explain the difference between compelling and convincing. Right. When compelling is just, oh, I want that market data. Right. If I knew what the prices were for the things, that's going to give me an indication of what it is. Or somebody looking for a hockey scholarship. If I have the directory of the hockey scholarship programs, both of those. Now, when you have them, that now indicates to you that you are talking to a person who's interested in getting a hockey scholarship or who's interested in the monetary world of whiskey, not the, not the um, drinking it or, or whatever, you know, but they probably are an enthusiast uh, too. So that's, I would, I would look at putting together that type of information and, um, you know, getting that together. I'm sure there's lots of um, print publications uh, that, you know, that somebody who would be um, an investor in that kind of thing would do that or transferring somebody who's used to the concept of investing in wine or uh, to build the case for uh, for spirits or for whiskey as uh, as well. Wow. Thank you, Dean. Wonderful. Philip, does that make sense? Get on stage. Get on stage. You hey. have to get on and bring your phone. Oh. We're gonna t we're gonna take a digital selfie, uh, Dean. Okay. <laughs> like like a Skype selfie or. Oh, that's so great. So. Yeah, but the bass down there. No, 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 you. Well, we'll do both. Awesome. Heel foto maken. Eentje met uh, ja. Dit is de enige hoor, dit is de only one. Otherwise. Uh... Oké, okay, awesome. Oké, okay, so that's cool. So now, ja. Yeah. Final question for Dean from the audience. Who wants to ask the final question? And the final question, you know, it has to be an amazing question. Let's see, like, over there, Remco has a question. Are you having fun, uh, Dean? Oh, this is great. I awesome. love this. Awesome. Hi, Dean. My name is Remco. I'm Dutch. Hi. I live in Belgium. I have a small pharmaceutical company. A real pharmaceutical company, you know, not not like, I Miami, say. <laughs> not like Miami Vice or Cuba. Uh huh. Right, right, right. We're launching a new healthcare product, which is basically for spiritual well-being. And I was wondering uh -huh. if you were to start a new community from scratch, an online community that would afterwards help me promote and better sell the product. How would you do yeah. this? Well, so it's a good question because sometimes, you know, that's all part of it is that you have to be able to, you have to have an, an audience, you have to have a, um, you know, a group of people to, um, to have the conversation with. And in the beginning, I wouldn't, it wouldn't matter that it was a small um, community, you know, it doesn't matter whether they are, uh, you know, it can start out with, with hundreds of thousands of, of listeners or hundreds of thousands of people in a community, you're going to start out with just a few people. And so I would look at from scratch, if it, there isn't already an existing community that you could model or be a part of, or be sort of um, introduced to is to think, what would be the title of the book that anybody that wanted this book would definitely be somebody that I would want to be in conversation with. So when you're thinking about, you know, that as a, uh, attracting your 
um, your audience, that's really going to be the the most important thing is to understand that people can say, these are my people. When you hear the words, I love marketing, that is crystal clear who we're talking to. And you know right away whether this is the community for you, right? So if you, I, I think that's all part of it is understanding who the audience is and thinking about what's going to resonate with them so that they know they're in the right place and then just continue to um, continue to grow and communicate with them. There's a great book, by the way, if you want to talk about community building. And there's um, a gentleman here in the U.S. who built one of the largest churches in the United States. And he um, wrote a book called The Purpose Driven Church. And he outlines and talks about the whole strategy that they used for starting from scratch with 12 people in their living room is how they started the church. And now they've got 15,000 or 20,000 members uh, that come to their, uh, that come to their church every week, but it started out with 12 people in the living room. And he goes through exactly how they, uh, how they ended up building that. It's one of the most, um, impactful books that I've read on, on community building. Awesome. 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 So any last words for you, Dean, do you have anything else to share? You're like, I need to, I need to share this or are we good? Uh, this was fun. Yeah. I really appreciate it. The, um, I, I will leave you with this, that I wanted to just talk about the idea of making sure that you are making offers to people that you're not just sitting back and waiting for them to take the initiative. And so I often describe this as when people opt into your list, it's like you're bringing them into your home. You're bringing them into your living room. And, you know, if I, if I brought you into my living room and I sat you in the, the living room and said, hey, if there's anything that you'd like, uh, there's lots of food and drink in the fridge, go ahead and, and help yourself. Um, that would be one thing, but it'd be very difficult for you to go and do that because most people don't like to impose on, on people. And, but if I went into the kitchen and I came out with a plate of freshly baked cookies and I came right up to you and I said, Hey, would you like a cookie? It would be very difficult for you not to take the cookie because I clearly went out of my way. I went into, I, I, they're already made, they're right here for you. And as close as we can get your offers to that level, the, the better off that you're going to be rather than just saying to people, if there's anything I can do for you, if there's any way I can help you, you know, please just feel free to call me anytime or email me. Uh, I'm more than happy to help. That is coming from a position of not wanting to take the initiative. That's coming from a position of waiting for your client to take the initiative rather than you. And, you know, the reason that is, is because we silently, we kind of, we don't want to be rejected. But the truth is that people are always waiting to be led. And so when you take a leadership position, if you know what would be the next best step for somebody, if you can package that up and make it seem like it's the most logical, easy to do next step and present it to them that way, it's so much easier than just kind of sitting back and waiting for people to respond to you or to, to ask you to go out of your way for them. That's amazing, that's amazing advice. Um, awesome. So for me to recap this this um, this this talk, um, three things uh, that we okay. can implement, like two things that we can implement like right away, like literally within days or maybe even hours, and one thing that's a really long term thing. So number one is a super happy fun day. Who's gonna do a super happy fun day really soon? Awesome, awesome, awesome. I'm gonna <laughs> have one next Saturday. So. Um, so that's number one, super happy fun day. 
Number two is uh, sending a nine-word email to revive old and deadbeat leads or just to have a, a really great conversation starter. Who's going to implement a nine-word email? Awesome. And the third thing, and it's a big thing, and that's something that you're really doing and have been doing, um, is really building a legacy. And who here is going to really build an amazing legacy? Awesome. A legacy. So cool, man. Dean. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate you. Um, this was amazing. Was this amazing? Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> so thank you so much. I will see you obviously in Amsterdam in uh, in July. We'll talk about that later. Oh, and. Uh, Day. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We're going to do a happy, super happy fun day. So thank you so much again. Give it up for Dean Jackson. <laughs> okay, was dat tof of niet? Okay, super. Ik word hier heel vrolijk van. Ik word er heel vrolijk van. En um, wat ik een beetje indirect eigenlijk hoor, een beetje um, getracht heb te doen is om jullie een klein beetje mee te nemen in mijn wereld eigenlijk. Dus in de wereld waar ik in leef en dat doe ik natuurlijk al heel vaak met content delen, video's en podcasts en dat soort dingen. Um, maar ik denk dat we flink stap aan het zetten zijn om, om daar een beetje een idee van te geven. En ik vind het, uh, het voelt voor mij heel goed om dat mee te brengen naar Amsterdam en dat met jullie, uh, met jullie te delen. Dus uh, ik, ik ben wel even benieuwd, wat, wat zijn een aantal inzichten die je vandaag hebt gehad en daarna gaan we afronden, want we morgen weer een drukke dag uh, voor de boek. Maar wie wil, wie wil een, een, een inzicht delen uh, met de groep? Yes, komt de microfoon aan. Over een paar minuten gaan we afronden, dus blijf nog even zitten. Dus dan hou ik het heel kort. Uh, nou, ik weet niet meer wie het zei, maar uh, aan het eind van de ochtend zei iemand, ik moet niet denken... Hoe, maar wie? Ik weet ook niet wie dat zei. <lacht> maar is goed, uh, goed advies. <lacht> dat, uh... Oké, okay, dan was jij dus. Maar, maar dat is dat, alleen maar topsprekers. Dus, uh, ja. ja. Dat, dat, <lacht> Volgende vraag. Nou, nee, nee, dus, dus. Maar dat is, een, dat is een heel waardevol inzicht, ongeacht wie het zegt natuurlijk. En, ja, want uh, uh, soms loop je zo vast op techniek en ik voel me nu heel oud nu ik dit zeg... Maar de, de, soms heb je... De, de, ik ben blij dat jij ook gewoon geen filmpjes uploadt, weet je wel? Ja. Bij mij gaat dat altijd fout. Ja. Dus wie kan het doen? Ja. Ja. Top. Mooie. Mooie. Wie wil nog meer inzicht delen? Een, een, misschien wel een doorbraak delen. Wie durft? Nee, we, we gaan geen vragen meer doen. Dus hier, Marcel, in het midden. Mijn naam is Marcel Wiekerink. En... Uh, ja, ik kwam er eigenlijk toch wel achter wat ik wel wist, maar niet heb gedurfd. Mijn prijzen moeten gewoon omhoog. Dat is een big one. En waarom ja. moet je prijs omhoog? Nou, omdat het... Ik, ik zat even op dat percentage te kijken vanmiddag. Uh, 14% boeit het wel en de rest niet. Dus ze moeten omhoog. Ja, mooie, mooie. Top, ja. top. Wie wil nog meer, wie wil nog meer een, een doorbraak delen hier? Mijn naam is Nathalie Baus. Het beste wat ik vorig jaar gedaan heb is ontspullen. Zo, nog één keer? Ik uh, het beste wat ik vorig jaar gedaan heb is ontspullen. Maar echt die hard zoveel mogelijk spullen weg. En ik werd steeds vrijer toen ik dat deed. Dat is wel anders. Ja. En het gevolg was dat er een kamer over is. Die was gewoon leeg. Er stond alleen een prullenbak op de grond. En ik ga in plaats van een man cave, ga ik daar een pushy lounge bouwen. Ja. Ja. Ah, we beginnen nu een beetje op niveau te komen. Dus uh, wie volgt? Wie volgt? Voorin, voorin. Yes. Ja, komt zo, komt zo. Wat zeg je? Oh, moet ik staan? Oh. Yes. <laughs> Hallo. Ik ben Arno. Uh, wat ik geleerd heb is uh, interruptie, uh, verlaagde productiviteit. En uh, nou, ik word nog alles gestoord. Hè? Dus uh, ik ga proberen minder gestoord te doen. En wat ga je, uh, wat ga je, um, wat ga je, wat ga je doen om dat te voorkomen dat je uh, gestoord wordt? Ja, praktische tips van telefoon wegleggen, ja. uh, e-mailprogramma uitzetten. Ja. Gewoon je werk doen en uh, pas op een bepaalde tijd uh, als de wekker afgaat aan de gang. Ja. 
Een paar simpele tips daarover. Alle apps van je telefoon afhalen, dus je Gmail-app, uh, alle app, Facebook-app, Twitter-app, alles van je telefoon afhalen is nummer één. Weet je, daardoor ga je al gewoon tijd uh, besparen. Zet je internet uit, dus gewoon fysiek internet uitzetten van je telefoon of van je MacBook, van je telefoon, van je laptop. Um, en daarin oefenen. En daar, weet je, sommigen van ons, en ik denk aardig wat van ons, die horen Dean praten over zijn super happy fun day. En hij doet dat in, omdat hij compleet relaxed is en het staat allemaal goed. En, um, maar hij is er ook in getraind om dat te doen. Hij is getraind om te ervaren dat als hij een super happy fun day heeft, dat de boel niet omvalt. En de meeste van de bedrijven die wij hebben, dus wij met z'n allen, de meeste bedrijven vallen niet om als je een dag niet heel actief aan het werk bent of als je een dag vrij neemt. Mocht jouw business omvallen omdat je een dag vrij neemt, dan, dan, dan is er werk aan de winkel. Dus dan is er werk aan de winkel. Maar train je er zelf in om er, om er oké okay mee te zijn om inderdaad tijd vrij te nemen. Laatste, laatste doorbraak, inzicht. Ik ben uh, Johan. Ik heb, uh, we hebben vandaag wel ontzettend veel informatie gehad. En één woord komt er constant tussendoor in heel veel presentaties. Dat is het woord focus. We hebben heel veel dingen die we zouden willen doen. Maar wat ik vandaag geleerd heb, is dat je moet focussen op één ding. En daarmee gewoon mee aan de slag gaan. Dan komt de rest vanzelf. Kijk, heel goed. Top man. Dus uh, ik vond het een top dag vandaag. Ik heb, er geno ik heb ervan genoten. Wat ik gisteren ook zei, ik, uh, ik, ik wil een event creëren waar ik zelf aanwezig wil zijn. Waar ik zelf in de zaal zou willen zitten. Ik heb dan het uh, voorrecht dat ik het mag organiseren en het met, met jullie mag delen. En ik ben er heel dankbaar voor. Dus vandaag voor vandaag heel erg bedankt. En ik zie er naar uit om jullie morgen weer te zien. Dank je wel. Dank je wel.